succulus is, is a word I coined, be, cramming together succulence and essence, because I think that's what we all want to capture in our pictures, the essence of our plants. Why do you grow your plants? What is it about these plants? It's about passion, relationship, and connection that we have with the plants. What I really, this is the opportunity when you photograph to portray the relationship you have with your plants. It's about you and your plants. And you find that passion, you find that joy. If you can identify it in words, then you can begin to really try and take techniques to bring that out in the photograph. To do that, you have to listen with your eyes, but listen in two ways. One to your plant or the plants out there, but the second to your heart. That you need insight to yourself. That's what's going to make your, your picture special. We think in images all the time. We interpret the world through our eyes. But it's so unconscious, so a part of us, we don't really think about it. Photography is all about bringing that to the consciousness. In music, we think of rhythm and flow, tonalities. The same visually, for all those of you who've gotten lost in your greenhouse, staring at plants and suddenly find that the time has passed. That's what it's all about. Capture what you were looking at in the photo. For myself, spines, uh, whether they're with the Alba Peloso or the Kinesiris Brigia, Spines have always fascinated me, both uh, metaphorically, but also just visually. So on this rigidissima, once I identified my connections, I could start looking at it more closely, at the new apial spines that are vertical, to the flat laying spines on the side, to the growth rings that show the different seasons and different colors reflected in the spines. But it's always been about more than just the spines. We have in habitat, in bud, in cresting, and in flower. So when I look at my plant, I try and tell a story with it. What is this plant about? I know I've talked about tenacity with my buddies and you get amazed at the conditions these plants in nature will tolerate. Capture that. If that's what amazes you, capture the amazement. I see more detail from my photography than I ever could with my bare eyes. And it's a question of curiosity for me, a sense of discovery. There's a beauty that is in the detail. Now, the fact that this is sold on the internet as dead sticks plant, it's one ugly plant contest. You think there's nothing to look at, but look at the upper left-hand corner because on closer inspection, when you look at the flowering parts of the plant, when you look at the epidermis of the plant and see all the little trichomes, sometimes what we look at is a question of scale and we see something plain 
it's only because we're not looking at the right uh, size, the right scale. It's like when we look into the universe, but it takes the space telescope to show us how beautiful some of those galaxies are. There are galaxies in our plants that sometimes you just have to look and explore. I have a little plant quiz here, pop-up. What cactus loves to dance? Right, it could only be one, the disco cactus. This may be the most important tech tip I'm going to give. Digital is free, which means you're free to experiment. I have two grandchildren. My uh, eldest uh, is a three-year-old who just learned that it's grandpa, not gopa. Didn't stop her at all for the first part of her life. My grandson, about a year old, is constantly doing face plants, trying to walk. We don't take beautiful pictures all the time with our initial efforts. But as adults, something holds us back sometimes. We don't take as many pictures or show them because uh, you know we're afraid that they may not be good enough. Just trash the ones you don't like, as my dad said, and he was a pro before me. The difference between a professional and an amateur is a professional doesn't show his waste paper basket. We all take miserable shots. I've thrown away tons of them. Don't be afraid, experiment. Make sure that what's important in the photograph is sure. When I was judging, that was the first thing everyone else on the panel looked at. Well, everyone, me included. If it's not sharp, where you want to see the detail, it's not going to be a good picture. That's except in rare situations like fog, but we don't need to talk about that. When we're talking about spines, we want to see them sharp. But focus is more than just the focusing of the lens. It's focusing the photographer. It's about concentration. When you want things in sharp focus, the best way to ensure it is to use the tripod. Now, I know most of you are not going to use a tripod. So what do you do? Take multiple images. This is one I took over at Kelly Griffin's house. He had this polyfilla in the garage and low light situation. We were going out to dinner, so I couldn't set up a tripod. So I took 15 shots. One of them was appreciably sharper than the rest. I chucked the unsharp ones out and I had the picture I wanted. When you think about it, hold a camera to your eye, click it, then click it 15 times. It takes you no time at all. But the result may be you have an image you're proud of instead of a blurry one. One of the things you're going to have to do is learn to control where the camera focuses go. With a, a phone, you punch it and a box will appear. That You can move the box over the screen to put it at the point you want in focus. The sun there we'll talk about later when we talk about adjusting exposure. With a single lens reflex camera or a digital camera, you press the shutter button halfway and recompose. There are other ways to do it a little more precisely, but that's gonna depend on each brand of camera. So it's something you can't get into on a talk like this but there'll be a center spot. You put it on what you want in focus. 
whether it's the eyes, the center of the flower, and then you recompose by holding the button and then pressing the button when it's after it's recomposed. I raised focus stacking because when it first started, it was all manual and it was an advanced technique. Now cameras are doing it if you set the menu to do it. A lot of the new cameras will, cameras from Nikon, cameras from Canon, it comes, it, there are two parts of it. One, image acquisition, to the processing of the images. Some of the cameras are even processing the images, but a lot of them, you'll have to take the image with the camera setting. It's set in the menu. It won't take long. It helps to have a tripod. In fact, it may be essential to have a tripod, but you start the camera, it takes it. And what it does is incrementally focus through the image. Now I'm gonna show you basically what it does. This was a hundred image stack. Thankfully, I'm not gonna show you all hundred image, but it's of a turbinate corpus pseudopectinatus. And if you know the plant, you're looking at about three fourths of an inch across from side to side. And the bottom of the ape of the depressed apex where I have my cursor, is probably about three eighths of an inch to half an inch down. So you can't capture it in a single sharp photograph. So what you do is you take the first photograph at the closest point and you focus on that. And then you successively focus through the picture. Here's the 25th. You can see you're going down towards the center. The 50th. You're almost at the bottom. The 75th, you're at the bottom in some spots and you're coming up in others. The 99th, you're at the other side. Then software, and I use two softwares, Helicon and Zareen, and you put it together in the software, which is automatic, and this is what you get for detail. You can't beat it. Here's another way of looking at it. I made a movie of a hundred image stack. And we're going to look at the movie. Look at first the tips of the flowers. That'll be the first area in focus. It'll proceed all the way to the back spines. See, we're working our way through the plant. It's now at the flower bud, picking up the back spines now. A little past everything. I always start a little before and end a little after because sometimes it's hard to see what's first and last. But that's what it does and it gives you a far more detailed image than you can get otherwise. Now, sometimes magic occurs in the lighting. When it does, when those plants sing to you, we've all seen those beams of light in the, our greenhouses where magically that plant looks better than it's ever looked. You have to take the picture. Those moments, are rare, those images need to be captured. The stapeliad, the stapeliad erectiflora on the right was taken as sun was setting, beautiful side lighting. Side lighting picks up all the detail, all the tiny hairs, that's about an inch of plant. And it gave everything a glowing orange color. You seize the magic and then you bring it home. 
that's what photography is all about. Now, I doubt there was more than two seconds between these two images. In the right hand, the light had ducked right, right under a cloud. So I had nice diffuse light. And the image on the left, it's harsh. You can see the shadows. The background is dark except for bright white where a beam of light was coming through. This was in Costa Rica in uh, underbrush. There were trees above. You can see the difference. Sometimes it's not backlighting. Sometimes it's not side lighting. Sometimes diffuse lighting is best, particularly when you have flowers. The softness of the flowers come through with very even lighting. When we're in the field, I use several reflectors and diffusion panels that soften the light. As you can tell, the one on the left has been well used. Also, you can use it to bounce light into the shadow areas too, and even out the lighting. But if you've ever noticed how hard it is to take pictures in bright sunlight, this will help. One of the ways photographers judge their exposure is to use a histogram. Nearly every camera has it, and there are apps that allow phones to display it. All it is is a graph of your tones, of the brightness of the image. The far left is absolute black. The far right is absolute white. Where there's absolute white or absolute black, there's no detail. So one of our goals is to, in most instances, to try and keep from uh, high ridges at both ends of the spectrum there. This is a well-exposed histogram. Let's see what it's an image of. You can see the histogram right at the uh, upper right corner. Now, if I have a histogram of an overexposed image where things are too bright, you could see how the values puddle up on the right-hand side of that histogram. Where it's too dark, you can see how the values puddle up on the left-hand side and the histogram doesn't stretch across that far. Learn to use your histogram will help you getting accurate exposures that, are, that look good. Again, this is a well-exposed histogram. I use ProCam and camera pixels for my iPhone. I think they're both available for many other phone apps too. My camera actually does it by itself, so I don't need an app. How do you adjust exposure on a phone? Well, this is the picture we saw before. And if you slide your finger up or down, you'll see it gets lighter or darker. You can almost judge it by the phone itself, the image on the phone. They're usually pretty accurate. But this will tell you, or this will help you adjust and avoid those situations where you get parts of the image that are just too bright or an image that's too dark. When everyone was shooting cameras instead of phones, nearly all the images were horizontal. Now that people are shooting their phones, nearly all the phone images are vertical. Well, take them both, whether you're using a camera or a standalone camera or a phone camera, take them vertically and horizontally. You'll miss so much. They have different feels to them.
one of the tricks is to try and get a different perspective. Challenge yourself to see something different. This perspective I got by when the Terry Quonsons were flowering at the Arboretum, I just lied down and shot straight up. A lot of our compositions have lines in them. Lines draw attention. Use your lines to focus the attention of the viewer. It's easy in wildlife photos to capture movement, but movement in a photo is so important. You don't want static compositions. One of the ways we avoid that is to use leading lines, but also try not to take the easy symmetry. Try not to center rosettes, for example. What we can do, I know it's hard to believe, so take the rosette in the center. Take the etch of area with the center in the center of the image then move it around the image. Remember, it's free, experiment, see what works. It'll take you just a few seconds to try, but I suspect after time, what you're going to see is the images where it's not centered or more dynamic, have more interest than the ones that are purely centered. Try and eliminate all, everything extraneous from your composition and simplify so you know what the focus of the picture is. And in this picture, we have Nolana, which is uh, a succulent nightshade. Who knew they were in the Galapagos? Who knew there were succulent members uh, or relations to the tomato plant? The red succulent down below is Sansuvium. It's a relative of uh, many of the South African plants that we so uh, enjoy. Same family. Now, whoever named this family should be shot. I can forgive using a dead language, that's our convention, but to string seven vowels in a nine letter word makes it virtually unpronounceable. So I went to the internet rather than Mangalud. And according to Emily, Azoaceae. That's how you pronounce it, Azoaceae. On the theme of getting back to concentrating our images, making them stronger by eliminating extraneous, distracting, details. Don't show random pot edges. I have no problem showing pots as pots, but random edges usually distract from your image. Find an angle you can avoid it or incorporate the pot in the image. Sometimes we think of photography as a single image rather than telling a story of the multiple images. So here's a single Hawarthia cooperi plant of mine. And I'm going to show you how it looks different over time and different angles. Here's a down view. Now we're looking to it uh, when light's backlighting it and it's glowing. A close-up of it glowing. A close-up of it glowing when it has its summer tan. Multiple uh, leaves of it with the summer tan. And then by the end of summer, it was really dark. All one plant. It's sort of like thinking about if you were taking plants of your family. 
your child at six is a lot different than your child at 26. To tell the story of that child, you need more than one photo. To tell the story of your plants, you need more than one photo. And there's so many ways to approach it. And then I started considering my other Cooper eyes. And because I like to look at things bigger, I like to see the detail. That's just a crop. I use my pho photography as much as a personal study guide for my plants as anything I'm going to share and publish. Here are a few more Cooper eye. I love the Venusti on the right. And here's a hybrid. You can see the Cooper eye in it. A study I did was on Mammaluthii spines. At, di at different magnifications, you see very, very different things. At one time's magnification, you see the head or the heads. At two times, you're starting to concentrate on one head, single head. At five times, you're concentrating on individual tubercles in the spines. With a microscope objective, you can see a single spine or a single tubercle spine cluster. And if you crop it, you can start looking at the individual spines. So much of my photography is devoted to curiosity, observation, seeing why the underlying reasons why I love this plant. And while I was in the Galapagos, saw this yellow iguana. Looks so knowing, right? Yeah, look at those spines in the tongue. The, the cacti in the Galapagos, which are mainly desert islands, volcanic desert islands, they form, they have two functions for the iguana. One, water. That's, there's no free water to be found. They get their water from the plants themselves. And of course, food. But being in Galapagos, it's more than just a good meal. This is the land of Darwin, land of evolution, of the origin of the species. So let's talk about evolution because the Apuncha I saw showed you Apuncha Ichaios grows in uh, several of the Galapagos Islands. It's evolved to a tree form with a thick bark that prevents predation from the, sea, from the iguanas and the giant tortoises. There are lava cactus in, in uh, the Galapagos. These cactus grow on the old lava flows where nothing else will grow. They're the pioneer plant. They grow in huge clusters sometimes, but it's always on the lava where nothing else will grow. You can see in this small cluster close-up how 
a lot of dentritus builds up in their spines. Sand gets caught there. Eventually, enough builds up that when the plant dies, other plants have a basis to grow. This little critter from the Galapagos is a Sally Lightfoot crab. And his language is as colorful as his corpus. The one thing I'm going to urge more than anything else, play, have fun, enjoy your photography. It's more than just taking a snap in there, done that. Yes, you're forming memories and do that too. But also play, be creative. If you don't like it, throw it away. You know, what do you do with all these pictures? Well, here's some of the things I've done. I had a quilting project, a gallery, an art gallery by us was show, had a quilting show and it contacted the photo group I'm in and asked if we could do some sort of photo quilts. So I remember the very colorful Afghans my grandma knitted. The first step I did to give a some sort of photo homage to her Afghans was try and use this small crassula as the basis of forming a fabric. I flipped it numerous times. You saw the first two flips. I flipped it upside down every which way and came up with a fabric that formed the base of my medallion. Then I started to make colorful squares that reminded me somewhat of my grandma's squares. They were symmetrical on four axes, horizontally, vertically, and on both diagonals. And they were colorful. This I took an agave desmontiana and just cut it up and started playing with it until I got a composition I liked. And then I made a whole bunch of squares. And in Photoshop, put the squares on top of the fabric I created. And this was my centerpiece for the quilt. I took, I printed that off on a 24 inch printer and glued that to black fabric, then stretched it on a picture frame. And that was my award-winning quilt. But I liked making squares so much. I found it relaxing. I found it challenging to visualize that when COVID hit, one of the things I did when I found myself getting depressed was I'd go make some, some squares. These are a few of the squares I made from this picture of a Mammalaria Hernandez eye. Make cards, I give them to friends. I send them as thank yous. I make birthday cards. There are a lot of programs that'll do it. It's very easy. You take the picture and then you type something. Calendars. I've made, uh, I didn't make one this year, but last year I did. They're fun. This way you live with your plants. They become a, more a part of your life. In spare time, I'll sometimes take an image on my iPhone and throw it through filters and play with it. That's the whole idea of it. Have some fun with your plants. See them in a different way. The other thing is you can contribute to your club. 
this is my helping hands photograph to uh, call people to Every year uh, we take uh, plants out of a greenhouse by the Arboretum and put them in the ground. And this was doing that. Every newsletter from every club needs photographs. Take them, send your best to the newsletter. Every newsletter editor will thank you. Do a program. If you want to learn more about a subject, take pictures and do a program. I guarantee you, you'll learn far more out of putting the program together than you would out of a program that you heard. Now, this doesn't go to taking better pictures. This goes to preserving that. Because if you don't back up, hard drives will crash. Phones will get lost or the data on them will get corrupted. Back them up. You can back it up to a separate hard drive. You can back it up to the cloud. But back it up. You would hate to lose your photos. And this is not only photos of your plants, photos of your family. Back up all your photos. The other thing is you can't use your photos if you can't find them. And I know I'm in a different class here because I'm tracking over a million photos. But I will tell you that remembering where you put, took a photo 15 years past is often a lot more difficult than you anticipate. There are two ways, primarily. One is by file naming and use of subfolders. The second one is more complex and allows you to use keywords, collections by using a digital asset manager, such as Lightroom. That's what I do, but there's a big learning curve. The advantage, however, is when I started out using Files, I'd have a file for maybe Mammillaria spinosissima. Then I'd have a file for lizards sitting on tops of plants. And the same photograph would go in multiple, multiple files sometimes, depending on the categories, like extreme macro. And when a new way of editing came, and I improved the photo, I'd have to remember all the places I put it. With Lightroom, I have only one photo that I can develop and put in multiple categories. But whatever works for you, the key is being able to find the photograph. The other thing is with today's phones, you imprint, you geotag every image. Now, if you post on Facebook, Facebook strips the metadata. If you do Instagram, it strips the metadata. However, if you block, if you email the photo, you are giving the exact location that you found the plant. And these days with poaching being what it is, next time you may not see that plant in nature again. So send a screenshot that strips the metadata. Don't send the original image. Well, I hope we shared a few laughs, a few smiles, want to leave you with this thought. Because I, I think sometimes we have forgotten how important a little kindness is in this world. Here's the mandatory sunset image. 
so I can actually end the program. If you have any questions that I don't get to answer, and please put your questions, not in the chat room, but in the question and answer, feel free to harass me.